Hello, everybody. This is Vikas Agarwal coming to you from University of Michigan, and I have Dr. Riyaz Bashir from Temple University Hospital so with us today, and we are going to talk to you about how to perform a balloon pulmonary angioplasty. I have no relevant relationships to disclose pertinent to this presentation. Dr. Bashir has an equity interest in Thrombolex Incorporated. However, he has no relevant relationships pertinent to this presentation. So Riyaz, I believe you have a wonderful case today for us. It's a 47 year old painter who has had a splenectomy. So take us through this case. Sure, uh, Vikas, thanks very much uh, for the invitation. And I want to thank the Sky uh, for the opportunity. You know, this is a very interesting case and, and highlights uh, some of the technical uh, considerations that we have in performing pulmonary balloon angioplasty. It also highlights how disabling this disease is to our patients and how pulmonary balloon angioplasty can really help them uh, immensely. This is a 47 year old self-employed painter who had his own company and had a traumatic splenectomy. And after the splenectomy apparently had developed multiple PEs uh, and basically got so disabled from shortness of breath, he had to actually stop working and had to close his company. Uh, his physicians uh, out of state did the VQ scan and CT scan and found that he had severe perfusion defects on the right side. The entire right lung had severely reduced perfusion. And he was sent to Temple University Hospital for evaluation of treatment of his chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and when he got to us, we performed a pulmonary angiogram, as you can see it uh, here, that all his proximal pulmonary arteries were free of disease, but you still see significant peripheral perfusion defects. And this is what we call level three CTEF, distal disease. And, um, and really in, in these patients, treatment with pulmonary thromboendotrectomy may not be optimal. And, uh, you know, because pulmonary thromboendotrectomy is a standard of care for patients with CTEF and it's curative in most of these patients. However, there is a, a fairly large number of patients who may not be candidates for pulmonary thromboendotrectomy. So how do you approach a complicated case like this at your center? Yeah, that, that's really an important question because, because I, I think this treatment should only be performed at at a center where there is a multidisciplinary CTEF team. You know, at Temple University, we have three uh, CTEF specialists. Uh, actually, we have four now with uh, Dr. Olivoras, we just hired. And all of them, their expertise is related to CTEF. And Dr. OJ, who, you know, came to us from UCSD. Has, has been a tremendous addition. We also have two interventionalists, myself and Vlad, uh, who just joined us back from MGH. And we have Dr. Teoda, who is our cardiothoracic surgeon. In addition to that, we have two radiologists who are looking at dedicated imaging for CTEF patients. So it's this multidisciplinary team that evaluated this patient and decided that we should go ahead with balloon pulmonary angioplasty. Yeah, you know, I couldn't agree with you more on this point that it is imperative to look at these patients in a multidisciplinary fashion. You know, we at Michigan have a similar team with expertise from pulmonary hypertension, radiology, interventional cardiology, vascular medicine, 
and and we do the same thing we talk about these these folks as a group and then so decide on so what's the best what's the best next step is so so, so i'm going to assume you guys I decided to offer balloon pulmonary angioplasty for our gentlemen here. That's correct. That's correct. So what do you need to be able to do balloon pulmonary angioplasty? You know, I, I have a slide in here a little bit later that talks about the uh, uh, equipment needed. But, but before I go to that, I wanted to emphasize the need for anesthesia and ECMO support during balloon pulmonary angioplasty. You know, in our center, every time we do a balloon pulmonary angioplasty, an anesthesia person is readily available to us if we need to do an emergent uh, bronchial blocker or an isolated intubation. And we also have an ECMO team ready in case there was severe bleeding into the lung. Um, hopefully we don't have to use them often, but having them in place uh, is really, really critical. It, you know, you, you should be able to pick up a phone and find an anesthesiologist on the other line who has training to do a bronchial blocker or an isolated lung intubation. Uh, so that's a very important thing before you get started with doing balloon pulmonary angioplasty. Absolutely, you want to hope for the best and plan for the worst, yes. so that's for sure. So now moving on to the technical procedure of BPA. So tell us how you do it. You know, one of the most important thing uh, in, in doing a pulmonary balloon angioplasty is to do a selective pulmonary angiogram. You saw the non-selective angiogram. It does not give you a great definition of distal lesions in the vessels. So you really have to selectively cannulate each segmental artery to identify lesions and then treat them appropriately. So the way we do it uh, is we usually use a femoral vein access uh, and uh, we put a swan in the, in the pulmonary artery, uh, obtain baseline hemodynamics and through the swan put a 035 wire and exchange length wire and switch uh, for a seven French long uh, 70 centimeter sheath, which we get all the way into the interlobar arteries. And then we take the dilator out and leave the 035 wire in place. And then over that 035 wire, we take a guiding catheter and selectively cannulate a segmental artery. And once we are in that segmental artery, we perform a selective angiogram. And, and if, we are, if there is a lesion in that vessel, we would go ahead, cross it with a wire. Uh, we initially, when we started, we were doing most of our cases with the, uh, with the pressure wire. Uh, now we're almost 50-50 where half of the cases we were doing without a pressure wire and half of the cases we're doing with, uh, with a regular wire. And then we dilate that lesion with a balloon um, and even measure the pressure distal to the lesion with a pressure wire if we're doing it on a pressure wire. That's a great summary of how you set yourself up to to cross the lesion and start a BPA. So we pretty much also do the same thing. The one thing I would add is some folks, uh, especially in Japan, have talked about inter internal so jugular vein access, especially for the right upper lobe. So in our experience, we've not had to do that. We've been able to pretty much cannulate selectively through the femoral vein axis for the right upper lobe as well. Uh, and sometimes I would use a guideliner as a telescoping catheter through my guiding catheter, both to, to alter the shape of the tip of the guide catheter, as well as to, to more selectively engage the proximal segment. And yep, so, so now that we are in the segments and we are doing selective and geography, oh, so this is a wonderful chart. So you have here, so we have about so various options for guide catheters. Uh, in the interest of time, I will move to the next one. 
Okay, so now we have done selective so angiograms. Please take us through the various kinds of lesions that you're highlighting there. So, you know, you saw the non-selective angiogram we cast earlier, and you really didn't get the details of the distal lesions in this patient. But when you look at the lesion right here in the upper lobe, you look at a slower flow in this branch, and you know that there may be a lesion somewhere here. And you can see mm -hmm. this lesion very clearly. You can see a web here clearly, and you see a tram tracking lesion right in here. And so when you do selective angiograms, you see these lesions very nicely, majority of the times, if you are selective. Mm -hmm. And then you want to wire those lesions while you are there. So really the critical step is to selectively cannulate a segmental artery. I agree with you 100%. So which vessels to treat first? How do you pick? Yeah, because so what we have done is we, we think that the lower lobes have the greatest gas exchange. And we usually start with lower lobes. And if a patient has a right or a left lower lobe involvement, we will start with the right and then go to the left. And upper lobes, we usually do last. Unless a patient has very few lesions in the lower lobe, then we'll do the lower lobe and the upper lobe at the same time. Uh, but we usually try to do the lower lobes first and more, more so the right lower lobe because the lung volume is higher on the right side. Mm -hmm. so we have the same approach. So we also look at the, the pre-procedure VQ scan and the pulmonary angiograms, look for the largest area of perfusion uh, deficit. And then if there is significant disease in the lower lobe, we of course want to target that first. Uh, so one other point I would I would like to make here for the audience is during each session of BPA, you want to treat one lung at a time. So do not do the right lower lobe and the left lower lobe in the same session. The reason behind, if there is a problem, there is a perforation, you always want to have that option to have the, the non-treated other lung to selectively intubate and save the patient. Okay, so number point, of sessions. Yeah. So what do you so what do you so tell your patients how many procedures are they going to need, and how do you do that? Yeah, that's that's a, a harder question when you don't have a complete selective angiograms uh, beforehand. But majority of the times, we usually give uh, you know one lobe at in one session. Uh, but if the number of lesions in that lobe are less, then we can do two lobes. Uh, really, uh, it depends on the number of lesions that the patient has, the number of segmental arteries, and even sub-segmental arteries, how many uh, lesions they have. Mm -hmm. but, you know, I would say on an average, our average is 3.5 sessions per patient. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them have distal disease like this patient has, and they need multiple uh, segmental and subsegmental dilatations. Um, so I would say around three to four sessions is, is optimal. Four sessions. Yeah. And uh, how do you pick your wires? What size, so what so wire quality? do you like so when you are trying to choose between wires? You know, because I, the way we have done it is we've always used open four wires and we avoid using hydrophilic wires as much as possible because the lung tissue is very friable and a perforation in a vessel in the lung can be catastrophic. So we try to avoid using any hydrophilic wires. We usually start with, as I mentioned earlier, with a pressure wire supported with a balloon. And, you know, 50% of the times we'll be able to get through those lesions. But another 50% of times I would switch from a, a pressure wire to a BMW wire. Uh, and if that doesn't work, may go to a run through wire. Um, and in in very rare cases like a CTO where I might need to use a hydrophilic wire like a graphics PT to cross a lesion, 
I would put the balloon down across the lesion, pull the wire out, and then advance a beamer uh, into the vessel. So I'm not working on a hydrophilic wire ever. Um, so that's how I, I select my wires. How do you do it, Vikas? Very similar, excellent point. I, I, so I use, a, I use a pressure catheter instead of a pressure wire, but I like the Xion Blue. That's my workhorse wires, so wire for these cases. I largely stay with Xion Blue, Pro Water, or a BMW. Uh, and then, you know, it's most of these patients have so many lesions and so many segments and subsegmental branches to treat that I think it's key to also not, also not get bogged down if a certain if a lesion is being hard to cross. Uh, so, so you move on to a, so you move on to a different segment, different subsegments. Because the goal here is not to open up every blockage. The goal here is to just open up enough that you bring the afterload down. Uh, but so that's how I do it as well. So, so, so that was great. So, so Vikas, so this is a slide. Here? Yeah, this is a slide I, I put in. This just shows how a pressure wire pressure looks like in these lesions. You know, in, in, in here, when you are proximal to the lesion, the pressure looks like a normal PA tracing. The mm -hmm. moment you cross a lesion, a web, it just turns into a wedge tracing. And you pull the transducer just into the lesion, it ventricularizes. And it tells you exactly where you have to balloon. And that's what I love about the pressure wire is it tells me exactly where I have to dilate and how much improvement in pressure I got. And, and the other thing it tells me is that how much distal pressure do I have to achieve? You know, many of these pressures, just like this patient at a pressure of 87 uh, systolic in the PA. We don't want their pressures in the alveolar vessels to get suddenly this high and they're going to have pulmonary. Mm -hmm. We want to keep this pressure at less than mean of 35 millimeters of mercury. And that's one big advantage when you are starting this program to keep this procedure safe, is to keep your distal pressure less than 35 millimeters of mercury mean. And, uh, and that's one of the advantages I have found, uh, you know, when we started this program. That temple. That's an excellent point, Suryas. I couldn't agree with you more on that. Okay, so now we're across the lesion. How do you pick your balloons and how do you size them? You know, uh, I, I have to say that this is uh, this is evolving uh, as I am gaining more and more experience in the in the procedures. Um, you know, I, uh, I learned it initially with, from Dr. Matsubara and, and he would say, do a smaller balloon inflation in as many vessels as possible in the first session, get the pressures down, let the vessels remodel and get the patient back for a next session when you use a more appropriate sized balloon. At that time, your pressures are better. Uh, and I still continue to do that. I undersize my balloon significantly in the first sitting and then get the patient for a next time when I do a one-to-one -one, uh, balloon to artery ratio dilatations. Now, when I do the first one, I usually start with a two millimeter balloon. I may go up to three millimeters in certain uh, segmental arteries. Uh, but usually try to do as many branches as possible with a two millimeter balloon uh, in, in some segmental vessels I would do three. What yeah. do you do, Vikas? I, yeah, I sort of have the same approach. I undersize my balloons by about one to two millimeters in most of these cases. Uh, I use compliant balloons uh, and I, if it's a CTO, I stay at 1.5 to 2 millimeters, make a channel first and see what I got mm -hmm. and then take it further. But I agree with you. The key is to stay conservative, stay, stay small. Uh, you can always come back and dilate it more later on. So that's great. Uh, 
So let's see. So here we can see some some post angiograms. Take us through these, please. <clears throat> sure, because uh, you see, the, these are the same vessels that you saw in the other slide before, and now they are after we balloon dilated them. Uh, you still see a fair amount of residual stenosis, but we did a pressure wire guided uh, balloon angioplasty and we had gotten decent distal pressure in this in this patient and and we did two sessions on him because he was out of state flying in uh, so we did two sessions you know separated by three days and and he he did really well he felt significantly better and um, and if we so uh, so, so that's that's what we did in in this patient uh, for his distal disease. Yeah, you know, and that looks like so you got an awesome result. You know, so when to stop a session, or so when do we say that the lesion has been adequately dilated? I'll give a few so tips on that. The best marker for adequate lesion dilatation in balloon pulmonary angioplasty is evidence of brisk so venous return on selective angiograms post angioplasty. And then, and you can see here the venous return in the background. The other important considerations, so when it comes to planning and stopping for a session or so we like to so we like to recommend that do not exceed your contrast load for the session altogether by more than so three times the GFR. It's an extrapolation from data that exists in the coronary literature. We want to stay less than two gray for radiation. Because of that, we generally don't recommend using subtraction angiography for pulmonary angioplasty. Subtraction angiography is recommended and used for non-selective pulmonary angiogram. So then as a, as a planning tool, we use IV heparin and we keep an ACT between 200 to 250. And we often don't need to reverse the heparin with protamine at the end unless you have hemoptysis or a problem. Uh, now, so is that what you also do, Riaz, or you do anything different? No, I, uh, we definitely keep uh, radiation less than two grays. Uh, absolutely, uh, I, I I don't have a cutoff on my on my contrast use. I do use a contrast uh, uh, whatever I need as long as patient's renal function is is normal. Um, and and I do my goal is to look for venous return, the, just like this patient. Once you start seeing venous flow. Uh, it's amazing that you may leave a vessel that doesn't look really good, but in three months or in a month, it will positively remodel and it'll start getting better. So there's one major difference in atherosclerotic lesions versus thrombotic, chronic thrombotic mm -hmm. lesions is there is positive remodeling after balloon dilatation. Uh, so, so don't try to make it perfect in the first go. Wonderful, that's excellent. So, so because this is his, this is his uh, non-selective angiogram after the two sessions, and you can see the difference in the peripheral wow. perfusion. Uh, this is before and this is after, and and you know this is just after the two sessions, and and usually hemodynamics take time to improve. So this is where we stopped, uh, and patient went home. Um, a month later, he sent us a VQ scan. His physician sent us a VQ scan from there. And you can see the perfusion in the right lung before and after. Mm -hmm. Clearly, there is a marked improvement. And, and more importantly, Absolutely. this patient felt so much better. He restarted his job, opened up his company again, and now he's doing his work, which is incredibly gratifying. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. You know, congratulations on a wonderful result. And, and you know, as we can see here, the six-minute walk distance has 
gone up remarkably. The PVR is down. The RV looks a, a lot more happier and healthier. Uh, so, so as we wrap up this wonderful discussion, a brief summary of all the equipment that you should have in your cat lab if you are planning uh, to perform a balloon pulmonary angioplasty. Do you want to take us through the three hours? Sure, sure. Uh, you know, because um, one of the things is we, we, we do have that table on the guide catheters. You know, I personally mm -hmm. use multi-purpose guide catheter and a JR4 guiding catheter and an AL1 guiding catheter. For most of the vessels, I use a uh, multi-purpose. JR4 I use for an A6 medial branch and for an A7 branch on the right side. And uh, AL1 I use for the left upper A3 branch and sometimes an A4 and A5 branch on the left side. Uh, the balloons and wires, we talked about that, but the things I wanted to highlight in this slide was the gel foam, an absorbable gel foam sponge, a gelatin sponge that is very helpful for treating wire perforations that cause hemoptysis. And I know we're going to do a separate session on complications, uh, but we need this gel foam in the cath lab. We need coils or vascular plug if there is a a vascular rupture or a vascular perforation. And, and this is uh, potentially uh, more likely if you're doing patients who have had pulmonary thromboendotrectomy before. And you obviously need all the equipment for intubation like bronchial blockers and, and a very quick to uh, experienced anesthesiologist if that is needed. Uh, so, so those are the main things. It's technically there are not, not that many equipment needs, but we need to have systems in place. So that was so wonderful. Thank you so very much for your expertise and for your time. I hope everybody is gonna find this conversation useful if they are planning or thinking about so learning how to do balloon pulmonary angioplasty. Let me close this by saying, this is still a procedure that's evolving, we need more folks uh, so in the community to be interested and to be engaged in this process. Uh, so we are all here working together to advance the field and to do the best for our patients. And with this, until the next time, thank you. Thank you very much. And bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.